Hello, and welcome back to Civics. Today, we're going to be talking about a specific upcoming Supreme Court case, Bracken versus Holland, and the U.S.'s interactions with Indigenous Americans. I think it's an important part of our history as the United States, and also part of our uh, civic discourse and our civic responsibility to understand how our nation interacts with the Indigenous people of our, of our country. Um, and how that's changed over time. So this PowerPoint or this presentation, this video is going to talk about this particular Supreme Court case and then how it fits into our general history of interacting with the indigenous people of the United States. So let's get started. What is Bracken versus Holland? Well, this Supreme Court case um, is challenging the Indian Child Welfare Act. This act was created uh, to put rules and regulations to protect indigenous children from the United States government. It also ensured that indigenous kids were kept with their tribes and communities and not stripped of their cultures as was regular in the 1800s and early 1900s. So this is a law that was put into place to ensure that the United States government couldn't do bad things to indigenous people and their children. Who are Indigenous Americans? They are people and cultures that were present in the United States prior to the arrival of Europeans and the colonization of their land. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, there were many tribes, right? Many peoples. There were so many Native Americans. Some say there was about uh, 10 million of them in North America. Some more conservative estimates place that a lot lower. There were many of them, however, um, spread across the United States, and each tribe and community had their own culture and society that is unique, just like European nations that ended up subjugating them. Let's talk a little bit more about the Indian Child Welfare Act. The Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1978 as a way to acknowledge the centuries of violence and genocidal practices of the United States against indigenous peoples. Prior to the ICWA, Indigenous children were often separated from their families and forced to renounce their cultural practices and language under threat of violence. So this meant that they couldn't speak their own languages, they couldn't practice their own religions, they couldn't do their own cultural practices, like what they ate and all that kind of stuff, all of that they weren't allowed to do. Children were shipped to harsh boarding schools or to oftentimes unloving white families throughout the country and not reunited with their families and heritage. The ICWA is an essential protection for these children of the indigenous population of the United States and a necessary part of a long overdue apology for America's past behavior. Um, this law, this, this Supreme Court case is a challenge against that. So potentially the Supreme Court could overturn the ICWA, which would allow the governments or state governments or the national government to start interjecting within the tribes once again. Let's talk a little bit about the history of American interactions with Indigenous Americans, because I think it's an important part of our civic history. Prior to European contact, um, there were millions of Indigenous Americans. There were several different major cultural groups that dominated the United States during the period before Europeans arrived, like the Clovis culture, the Nadane culture, the Oshara culture, Poverty Point in Louisiana, and the Mississippian culture. There are many other smaller groups that had unique cultural traditions, but these larger groups built sprawling cities and sophisticated societies, just as sophisticated as the Europeans who would eventually land in North America. After 1492, Europeans began to arrive and explore the land that would become the United States. And during this time, Europeans excluded indigenous Americans from land ownership, prioritizing their own claims to land. So basically they took the land that of the people that were already there. Europeans brought epidemic diseases like smallpox, massacred indigenous people, and destroyed their sources of food, which vastly lowered their population. Colonization would directly lead to the destruction of these indigenous populations, from the roughly 6 million people before European contact to only 600,000 in 1800. So that's the loss of over 5 million people, directly due to the action of these Europeans who came. American colonists actively tried to eliminate indigenous people and cultures during this colonization period. So this wasn't just an accident. This was an active choice that American colonists chose to do during this time period. Under President Washington, the official American Indian policy began, and he had a six-point plan. One, impartial justice towards Native Americans. Two, 
regulated buying of Native American lands. Three, the promotion of commerce between Native American tribes and the United States of America. Four, the promotion of experiments to civilize or improve Native American society. Five, the presidential authority to give presents to Native American tribes. And six, punishing those who violated Native American rights. This policy began the general, um, the general push for the United States to try to educate indigenous Americans in the European style. Note number four, right? Trying to civilize these Native Americans, even though they were already civilized, just not the same way as they were. In the 19th century, the United States began to actively expand West, much to the expense of the indigenous people already there. The expansion of the United States brought many conflicts with indigenous societies. And during the vast majority of the 19th century, the United States Army was at war with indigenous tribes, oftentimes slaughtering entire villages. Um, there are so many different wars we could talk about, um, but generally they're all kind of lumped together as the Indian Wars. And it's uh, a, a long century wide, uh, century long effort of the American army to kill and control these people. Many presidents actively removed indigenous Americans from their homes and land. Andrew Jackson famously removed five tribes from Florida and forced them at gunpoint to march to Oklahoma. In 1851, the Indian Appropriations Act set up the reservation system, changing the country's Indian policy. Under this initiative, tribes were condensed and forced into small reservations, oftentimes far from their ancestral homes. The U.S. Army was often in charge of watching these reservations and would often commit atrocities like massacres against the people the government forced into this situation. In 1871, Congress passed the latest Indian Appropriations Act and added a special provision to this law. After 1871, the U.S. would stop recognizing additional tribes and prohibited the signing of additional treaties with the tribes that were recognized. This new law left many indigenous tribes out in the cold and missing out on federal aid and resources from the government. Another major policy change in the 19th century was the establishment of the Indian boarding schools. These boarding schools were created to immerse indigenous children in American society. These boarding schools required indigenous Americans to speak English only, they were forced to practice Christianity instead of their native faiths, and they stamped out their native customs, turning them into model, heavy quotation marks, European citizens. Many children died at these boarding schools, and the children were heavily traumatized. Now, uh, these boarding schools are considered a part of the United States genocide of indigenous Americans. In 1919, Woodrow Wilson finally began the process of granting citizenship to Indigenous Americans who had been excluded from the rights of citizenship since the beginning of the United States, often treated as foreign entities. In 1924, Calvin Coolidge signed the Indian Citizenship Act, which granted all Indigenous Americans citizenship as long as they lived within the United States. So Woodrow Wilson kind of began this. Basically, he was granting veterans of wars citizenship. And then in 1924, Calvin Coolidge said anyone who was still living in the United States was granted citizenship. In the modern day, Indigenous Americans have all the rights of citizens, like the right to vote and run for office. In fact, our Secretary of the Interior is an Indigenous American. In the 1940s, the government changed Indian policy to become what known as termination. In this policy, the federal government stopped recognizing the sovereignty of tribes and stopped letting the Indigenous people run the reservations removed exclusions from state laws for indigenous tribes as well. The termination policy lasted until the 1960s when activism convinced the government to change policies once again. So basically this was an active effort to destroy tribal uh, society for Native Americans, their, their original culture. Activism by young indigenous Americans has led to the self-determination policy, which is what we're under now. Under this new policy, Indigenous Americans gained civil rights protections under the Civil Rights Act in 1968, and a few years later, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act allowed tribes to run themselves. Since then, Indigenous tribes now have developed organizations to administer their own business, social affairs, and housing programs. Tribes have even begun to open their own community colleges using land grants and utilizing cultural curriculums. However, there are lots of contemporary Indigenous issues that are still a part of American life. So we're gonna go over some of those now. First of all, indigenous Americans face discrimination and racism constantly in the United States. 
Most Indigenous Americans report that they rarely see others like them outside of their own homes. And many of the prejudices and mistreatments have been amplified by the way Indigenous Americans are portrayed in film and television. This feeds into stereotypes and the negative perceptions about these communities. Native Americans also protest and campaign against professional and college sports teams to remove Indigenous imagery from their logos. Two of the more recent professional teams to make changes were the Washington football team and the baseball team in Cleveland. As you can see here, uh, Cleveland's baseball team used to be called the Indians, and this was their logo, which you can tell is pretty racist. They're now the Cleveland Guardians, a non-Indigenous American name. Same thing with the Washington Redskins, a slur, which are now the Washington Commanders. Many universities and professional teams have refused to budge on the issues. This issue, um, think about uh, the Seminoles in Florida um, and uh, other such schools like that. There are also economic barriers to development in the Native American community. Although some tribes have overcome some economic issues with casinos and gambling on their land, many still struggle to manage. Reservations are often placed away from economic centers in the country and are occasionally in food deserts, places where easily acquiring food is hard to do. Indigenous Americans suffer from more barriers to economic success, and they were identified specifically in a study in 2008. A few of those uh, barriers are the lack of access to capital, so funds to do things, the lack of education and skills, especially on reservations, the lack of natural resources available to these uh, Indigenous Americans, no investment from outside of the reservations, and reservation factionalism, which divides the reservation on how to best move forward. Of course, we can't go on without talking about trauma. Indigenous Americans live in a society that have caused major generational trauma to them. Many of the individuals who now lead their people have experienced the terrible trauma of Indian boarding schools, racism, and other things, um, and this has impacted their society decisions and lives. So just like African Americans, just like Asian Americans, just like Jewish Americans, just like many other groups of Americans, Indigenous Americans are living with centuries of trauma that have um, changed their lives and their societies. So in summary, what happens if the ICWA is ended? Let's head back to that. If the ICWA ends, tribal families and communities will once again be vulnerable to separation and cultural destruction. Tribal sovereignty will be under threat once again, yet another betrayal of a people that have been betrayed by the United States so many times before. If the ICWA ends, indigenous tribes may get destroyed completely. We, it might finally happen after all this time. So that's why this kind of, this case can't go that way. Thank you so much for watching and learning about this important Supreme Court case. Um, if you uh, feel very strongly about this, uh, we suggest potentially writing a letter to your senator or congressman, um, asking them to um, maybe uh, take up this issue in Congress um, and, um, of course, help out any way you can. There are lots of local charities um, and um, organizations that help out Indigenous Americans. Um, that can always use your support. Thanks again for watching Civics, and we'll see you next time when we learn more about our government. Bye.